scripture reading for this morning comes from Hebrews 10, verse 1. Hebrews 10, 1. <clears throat> for since the law has, has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Please be seated. And welcome to all, and we also say welcome to our online audience today. We're in day number seven, day number seven of the 40 days of prayer. Do we believe in prayer? Yes, we believe in prayer. And we are offering up to God for these 40 days sincere prayer. Prayer for our nation and prayer for different prayer needs because why? Our world is in need. We have so much troubles and problems and sickness. We need the healing touch of the great physician. So join with us in the 40 days of prayer. A little advance notice. Tonight, during our evening worship service, we're going to have another Bible investigation. This one, this question comes from a person who believes in faith only. And he presents in his question what he considers his greatest defense of faith only. Come back tonight and uh, see how I answer his question. Meanwhile, let's turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. The preacher got up very early that morning. He had his breakfast. He decided to go out for a run. His wife and children were, were still asleep in bed. When he got back from his run, as he was approaching the front door, he could hear a voice. And he recognized the voice. It was a voice of his wife. But it was in a tone that he had never heard, ever in their marriage. He could tell that she was very upset. So he goes in the house and walks to the living room. And there he sees his wife. And she is standing over their two children. The two children are seated on the sofa. Now that sofa was a very unique piece of furniture in their house. You see, every piece of furniture in their house was a hand-me-down from family members. They did not have any new furniture until they bought that sofa. That sofa was his wife's dream sofa. She wanted to start uh, her furniture with that one piece of furniture, that sofa. And the husband, the preacher, he could tell that his wife was really upset and, and all. And, and uh, then he noticed the problem. Because on that sofa, in between the two children, on the couch, there was a stain. A strawberry jelly stain. And, and, and she was saying, I told you kids, never eat on this sofa, never play on this sofa, don't touch this sofa. This sofa was off limits to you. Now who, who's going to confess? Who's going to say they did it? That preacher, he felt so sorry for his children. Because, you know, they, they were hearing their mom in a voice that they were not used to. And, and they didn't know what to do. And that preacher, he felt so sorry for his wife because this was her dream piece of furniture and now it was ruined. And that preacher, he sure felt sorry for himself because he realized that he was the one that put the jelly on the couch. You know, sometimes we're at fault. In fact, many times we're at fault. The truth is... Every one of us, we're guilty of that stain on the sofa. 
See, Romans chapter 3, for all, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. None of us are perfect. Not one of us. There's an ugly stain on every one of us. And no amount of blaming others or keeping quiet about it will ever solve the problem. So what do we do? What do we do about the mess that we have made of our lives? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. For since the law has but a shadow, circle that word shadow, of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, it can never by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year make perfect those who draw near. That old law just couldn't make people perfect. It was impossible. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins? If it worked, if it had worked, there wouldn't need to be more sacrifices. But the truth is they, kept, they had to keep on sacrificing because it didn't work. It just momentarily removed it and never gave them true forgiveness. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder. Circle that word reminder. A reminder of sins every year, for it is impossible that the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. It just won't work. It won't work. If you, won't take, if you want to take care of your sin problems in your life, then what? Don't depend on empty rituals and rules. Don't depend on yourself measuring up with just empty rituals and rules. Don't rely on that. Instead, rely on Jesus. The author here of Hebrews he is addressing a Jewish audience, Jewish Christians. So he refers to the animal sacrifices of the Old Testament. Those animal sacrifices didn't work. Those sacrifices were just a hint of the real solution that was to come. It was, as he says right here, a shadow. What's a shadow? Is a shadow a real person? No, a shadow is just cast by the real person. It's an image of what is to come. Those sacrifices didn't work. More than that, those sacrifices were only short-term fixes. One year. And guess what happens after one year? You've got a sin problem. Again. They were short-term fixes. Now, those common, the common practice of those religious rituals only served as a reminder. One preacher was approached by a member in his congregation. She wanted some help with her marriage. He, uh, she said, you got to understand, 15 years ago, I made a terrible mistake. I had an affair and I told my husband, the preacher said, well, I, uh, I would imagine since you're still with that husband, he forgave you. She said, yes, she, he forgave me. She said, yeah, and he reminds me every week that he forgave me. You see, really, he had not forgiven her. He was still holding it over her head. That's the way it was with the Old Testament sacrificial system. It, it didn't remove the sin. It was only a reminder of the sin that would come due every year. You see, rules and regulations cannot remove sin. So what must we do? We must let Jesus make you holy. Let Jesus make you holy. Let Jesus take away your sin. Let Jesus separate us from that sin. Verse 5. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, He said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, 
Father God, you don't desire those sacrifices, those offerings, but a body have you prepared for me. And burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. You don't take pleasure in those things. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. When he said above, You have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he added, Behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. God is not interested in pomp and circumstances. He's not interested in religious rituals. He's interested in loving obedience. In 1 Samuel 15, God told King Saul, you wipe out the Amalekites. King Saul, thinking for himself, decided to bring back a little booty, a little spoils of the war. What did the prophet tell him? 1 Samuel chapter 15. Samuel said, verse 22, Has the Lord, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and, and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. God has always sought after loving obedience. He wants us to love Him and He wants us to obey Him. God wants our obedience more than any pomp or circumstance or rules or rituals. Jesse James at one time in his life, he hid out here even in Arkansas. He was a very famous uh, uh, robber, robbing banks and trains. And he also killed a few people. Did you know that he was a member in good standing at the Kearney Baptist Church? Yeah, that's right. After he killed his very first person, he was baptized at that church, became a member. After he killed his second person, he began to lead their choir. <laughs> Can you believe that? Yeah. Jesse James. So what does that say? It says this. Religion means nothing if you are not also truly righteous. Living a right life. Doing the right things bringing honor and glory to God. The observance of religious rituals is meaningless if you're not living according to God's will. And, and that's why Jesus came. Look, look at verse 10 now. And by that will, by God's will, we have been what? Sanctified. That means made holy. We've been made sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Once for all. He separated every believer from their sin unto himself. He sanctified us. Jesus did what religion could never do. By his death on the cross, he took away sins forever. I invite you to let him do it for you. Now, you might recognize this product. Many years ago, this product was a big boost in the business office. Because before that, if someone was typing up a, a document and they made a mistake, what, they ha what did they have to do? Well, they had to take that piece of paper out of the typewriter and throw it away because it was wrong and you had to type it up again. But when this product came out, suddenly you could paint over your mistakes, and you could type over it. And then later on, uh, computers, uh, you remember that magical key there on that computer called delete? You can just delete what's wrong. My friends, people... People are not self-correcting. In fact, 
people are self-destructing. That's the reason why we need Jesus. We need Jesus to make us holy. More than that, rely on Christ and let Him make you whole as well. You see, there's a part of us, there's a God-shaped hole in every one of us. And only God, only God Himself can fill that hole. We can try to fill it with pleasure, with possessions, with fun, with excitement, whatever, but it won't work. That hole will remain empty. Only God can fill that hole. Let Him make you whole. Verse 11, And every priest stands, they stand, daily at his, at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. In the course of the work of a priest, he did everything standing up. He did not sit down. He stood up to do what he was required to do. The priests are always standing. Why? Because their work was never done. But how about Jesus? When we see Jesus pictured in heaven every time except one time, and that one time is when Stephen is about to die, and it says that Jesus was standing, almost like welcoming Stephen home. Come on, Stephen, it's just a few more moments. The only time he's pictured as standing is there with the stoning of Stephen. All other times, Jesus is pictured as sitting. Why? Because his work is done. He did it. On the cross, His work is done. Verse 12, But when Christ had offered for all time a single, a single sacrifice for sins, He sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until His enemy should be made a footstool for His feet. For by a single offering, He has perfected Perfected. He has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Jesus' one sacrifice completed the process that was required. The tense of the verb there, the tense of that verb indicates an action that took place one time but continues to have results, continues to have results. In other words, Jesus' one act not only started you on the road to sanctification, it guaranteed the completion of that process. Philippians 1, 6, he, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Your ultimate perfection is not the result of your efforts. Your ultimate perfection, which is made possible in Jesus, is made possible only by Jesus. It's God's work that's already been accomplished for you. That led one woman to write this. At one point in my life, I was trying to be the perfect woman. I was involved in, in so many community efforts, but it was that feeling. It was that feeling in the back of my head that I was never good enough. That whole perfectionist thing was driving me. I could do my best, but it wasn't good enough. I think, I think we're living in a culture that is so demanding today. People are exhausted at the end of the day. A lot of people, a lot of people have to self-medicate because it would be hard for them to look in the mirror otherwise. So what happened to me? She says, I became an alcoholic with two parents who had had their own serious trouble with alcohol. Alarm bells should have been ringing, but my habit seemed relatively harmless and innocent, common even. 
a glass or two it seemed innocent enough. You know, the alcohol would smooth the switch from my hectic work schedule to my role at home. It just seemed to make my life click. I could juggle a lot until, of course, I couldn't juggle anymore. There's that thing about a drinking problem. It's progressive. A long, long time, you know, alcohol can make you step up, but alcohol will make you sit down. It will kick you out of your life, and you will fail. My dear friends, let's not turn to alcohol or drugs or, or shopping or excessive activity or sex or, or whatever it might be. Let's turn to the only thing that can really make a difference. Let's turn to Jesus. Let's turn to the Lord. Enter into a real relationship with Jesus. Let Him make you holy. Let Him make you whole. And third, third, let Him set you free. Did you realize you need to be free? Are you battling with the chains of guilt, of shame, of sin? Is it weighing you down? Allow Jesus to release you from that bondage of guilt and shame and sin. Let Jesus deliver you from the prison of your imperfections. Verse 15. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. For after saying, this is the covenant that I'll make with them after those days, declares the Lord, I will put, I will put my law where? On their hearts. I will write them where? On their minds. God promises to give you an internal desire to please Him and to remove those things that don't please Him from your mind. Only if you will allow Him. Verse 17, then He adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds. How? No more. No more sin, no more shame, no more guilt. I will remember them no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. No need for any more offerings. Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid it all. God promises to forget your sins, freeing you from having to pay for those sins. George Washington, right before he took office for the first term, he borrowed a book, a book called The Law of Nations. He borrowed it from the historic New York Society Library. And then because he was involved in running a country, he forgot to return it, ever. In that book, stayed at Mount Vernon for 221 years, sitting on a shelf. No one ever took the time to open the book. When someone finally did in, in 2010, they opened the book, they discovered, hey, that's not our book. It belongs to the library. They returned it. The overdue fees was over $300,000. Fortunately for Mount Vernon, the library decided to forgive the debt. Much more than that. Much, much, much more than that. God has forgiven our debt of sin against Him through the power of His Son. If you want to take care of your sin problem in your life, don't depend on yourself. Depend on God. Depend on Jesus. Enter into a real relationship with Jesus. Let Him make you holy. Let Him make you whole. And let Him set you free. You know, we battle. We battle with our sins. Our sins are big. 
They separate us from our God. Our sins, our guilt, and our shame, it can overwhelm us. Our sins, it can be spiritually detrimental. Our sins, it can be overwhelming for sure. They laugh and smile and talk and embrace, and I do too. But sometimes my smile covers a tear, and no one knows Right now, my tear is from an it. I'm sorry. So very sorry that I did it. I feel like a broken record. And the skip, the skip is the it that never completely goes away. What would they think if they knew about my it? Would the laughs vanish would the smiles disappear? Would the talk, would the talk be about me and my it? Would they take back that embrace? I wonder if they have an it. What do they do about their it? Why, why do we act like we do? Playing a part when there's no play, there's only life. And that life includes a lot of its. The point is not to celebrate it, but only to admit it. I am told that Jesus knows everything, which means he knows about my it. And yet he whispers, in words too good to be true, I died for you. It is dealt with. Don't worry about it. Have you allowed Jesus to take care of your it? Have you allowed him to wash you clean by his blood? Won't you listen to his words to believe, John 8, 24, to repent, Luke 13, 3, to confess, Matthew 10, 32, to be baptized, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Most of us here in this building this morning, most of us have done that. Those of us who have reached that age of accountability, we have made that decision. Praise be to God. But sometimes we allow it back into our lives. As a Christian, we are blessed with that avenue of forgiveness. If only we will seek his forgiveness. 1 John 1, 9, the church here is ready to pray with you and for you. James 5, 16, will you make a stand for God? Will you let Jesus make you holy, whole, and free today? If you have a need to respond, please do so as we stand and sing for your encouragement.